And welcome back to the Cover 3 podcast here on CBS Sports. That's Tom Fernelli. That's Barton Simmons. Uh, this was something that we predicted just hours ago. Well, excuse me, only two of us really were all on board with the idea that we might have to gather together on, excuse me, that we might get the opportunity to gather together on Sunday uh, in an emergency podcast situation. And it is because... Lovey Smith is out at Illinois. That is what this <laughs> podcast is. No, listen, we've got to get to Lovey too, because that also happened. But the we we declared Gus Malzahn, Auburn moving on uh, from the putt-putt offense after eight seasons, 68 wins. Um, this, this is now uh, one of the most coveted jobs that we could imagine. So number one, um, our, our initial reaction to the news did it come as a as as much of a surprise on Sunday uh, as it seemed to you on Saturday night, Barton Simmons? Yeah, I'm surprised. Gus Malzahn was dancing in the locker room. He thought he saved it. He thought he was gold. I just the, to me, it's he just beat Alabama last year. This is a COVID season where there are a lot of um, a lot of excuses, things. But he would typically. In, if the schedule was what it was previously, and we would assume a team and similar outcomes, he would be probably at four at minimum, maybe nine and three, um, twenty-one buyout. And so it's not as if I mean again, and this isn't me throwing down on Auburn for firing a guy that it shouldn't have fired. I I get it. You can do whatever you want. If I, I understand the restlessness, you're ready to move on. You're ready to move on. I'm just surprised that this, this season, this year, these circumstances are the ones that have firing. It's just. What do you think, Tom? I mean, it's, it's a situation where like I said on last night's show, I've, I'll believe it when I see it because we've heard it so often that just kind of starts to become background noise after a while. So it's happened. So I can't say I'm shocked, but I am, I, I did wonder if it would happen. I did. I wasn't a hundred percent convinced it was going to happen. And the, frankly, the fact that it is happening and they did pull the trigger on it tells me like, we're going to, I understand we're probably going to get into the, well, who's going to be the potential replacement to replace them. I think, I think they already have the replacement. hundred percent. Yeah, because it's not like a it's it's like the Texas situation with Tom Herman. When you have that large of a buyout and you have to spend all that money to make the change, you're not going to do it unless you know you're getting who you want to do it with. So that way it's not, you know, you're not just throwing all that money away and then you might end up with your third or fourth choice. So I'm sure they'll wait the prerequisite amount of time before making the announcement. But I'm pretty sure Hugh Freeze is the next head coach at Auburn. Uh, if Hugh Freeze is not coaching this year, or if he, if his presence isn't there, Gus Malzahn still has his job. I firmly believe that Hugh Freeze and Hugh Freeze's success with Liberty this season uh, has basically created a scenario where Auburn believes that we need to make this move right now because we only think there's a handful of coaches that are going to be able to get us to where we want to be. And getting, getting you to where you want to be is, yes, beating Alabama, which Gus Malzahn did, but, and I'll, I'll give credit to Barrett Salee, who just said this on CBS Sports HQ, it's also trying to get somebody who's going to be able to have success with a quarterback. It's going to be uh, a coach who's going to be able to field a successful offense. And the best Auburn teams recently have kind of been led by their defense with the offense, just kind of figuring it out along the way. So we haven't seen Bo Nix, uh, you know, become this, this superstar while at the same time, former Auburn backup Malik Willis is having a ridiculous year at Liberty if Hugh Freeze is not in the picture, I think Gus Malzahn still has his job. And for that reason, I feel so confident already taking the steps to imagine what the Hugh Freeze Auburn program might look like. Yeah, he's already buying his orange and blue tie. So, so do you feel like you're, you're that confident that the guy they've circled is Hugh Freeze and not, say, Billy Napier? Oh, 100%. Or, okay. Billy I mean, Napier doesn't have a win in Tuscaloosa with Larry Mutunsel suspended. Yeah, that's that's like I don't I don't think Auburn is spending twenty one million to get rid of Gus for Billy Napier. I just don't. I think that they they're going to want the proven commodity, the home run hire, the guy that the fan base has kind of been pining for on message boards all season long. I I, I mean maybe maybe it's Napier, maybe it's Mario Cristobal. I I, I don't know, but I would 
I just believe it's it's already freeze, and it's only a matter of time until freeze feels it's right to break the news. The the one that's floating around on hot boards right now that I just just would love for the content is Lane Kiffin. No, we can't. We can't. I mean, Lane Kiffin anywhere is great for content, but it, this one is be even the- better. Because he's in the Iron Bowl against Saban instead. Bowl and one-year-old man is just like, you know, just another, I'm sure he'd just leave another furious fan base in his way. Just, there'd be so many amazing conversations we could have around that one. Do you, do you think there's any chance that, like, the reason Arkansas State so quickly moved on and hired Butch Jones and made that announcement last night is that they didn't want to be with their job open with Gus available? Because then they feel they probably would have had, like, a whole lot of pressure to hire him. I tell you what, I think that Gus has in those opportunities where they pull him up on the desk because Alabama is always playing in the playoff and Auburn's not playing in the playoff. And so I've been in, you know, so many college football playoff games where that set that they've got right there on the field before the game, Gus Malzahn's just like, Oh, heck yeah, I'll come be an Alabama expert. You know, like, and he just gets up there and, and gives this whole scouting report. And I think he's tremendous. And so if you've got, 21.75 21.75 reportedly 21.75 million dollars in buyout money coming Woo! why don't you just take that to the analyst role until the buyout checks end and then you can get back uh at arkansas state or jump in wherever you want speak speaking of content how about this next year sec network analysts gene chizik and gus malzahn oh, together please. at halftime <laughs> please it'd be incredible I would, I would absolutely be down with it i think that gus malzahn has been good for auburn but i don't uh criticize auburn for wanting to to make the move because it does feel like in the same way that kevin sumlin has gone from being offensive prodigy to it feeling like all that has tailed off over time, we've kind of got that right now with Gus Malzahn. Here's a tweet right now from Brett McMurphy. If Hugh Freeze leaves Liberty, former Baylor coach Art Pryles would be the leading candidate to replace Freeze, sources tell Stadium. No question. That makes perfect sense. Well, they've got the old Baylor president or athletic director. One of the two. Just (laughs) God, they do not care at all. Grace and forgiveness. So the, uh, oh, this was another interesting piece of the puzzle. Apparently, um, according to Dennis Dodd, who spoke with sources close to the situation, uh, the remember the double secret probation for Hugh Freeze when he was potentially a target for Alabama's offensive coordinator, but then it was strongly suggested that maybe it was a little bit too soon. Dennis was saying earlier today that he uh, heard from someone close to the situation that South Carolina had already gone through this approval process, you know, checking in with Greg Sankey in the sec office. Hey, you know, we're thinking about Hugh freeze, you know, would that be something that's okay? So Auburn basically gets the rubber stamped approval that South Carolina put in all the effort to get. And then it says like, Oh, okay. Hey, do you mind sending over that paperwork that you sent back? I'm going to just change the name on it. You know, you can just, you can just treat it like a, one of those old paper classes from UNC where it's, you just change the name at the top and make sure you fill in the new date in the correct section number. You can just turn in the same thing because Hugh Freeze, again, according to our Dennis Dodd has has gotten whatever, whatever approval that he needs from the back channels at the SEC to make his return. Like that's, It's just all lining up. It's too easy. That's why I'm not even going to take myself to the Billy Napier Auburn era because I just, I think that the answer is right in front of them. You know, it's funny, like um, not to hijack this away from Auburn and into another school, but Auburn has always been to me very parallel to Michigan in that good, successful under Jim Harbaugh, good, successful, not the best team in their rivalry, not the best team in their state, uh, I guess not state, but in their rivalry, uh, they have pump out successful seasons where they're top 15-ish, but maybe just fall a hair short from what you would like. The only difference being that Gus Malzahn is competitive with his rival. Gus Malzahn has beat his rival. So that we're sitting here and Gus Malzahn is actually being fired before Jim Harbaugh, one year after beating Alabama, and Jim Harbaugh heading into his last year, his contract next year is still sitting there with a the job, is, is just interesting to me. I guess it's maybe just it just means more SEC kind of branding. 
Um, but it's, it's interesting parallel because Auburn has been the more successful version of Michigan uh, in a lot of ways. And, and yet, here they go, getting rid of their guy. Priorities are a little different. And I don't even mean one's better or one's worse or anything. It's just the priorities are different. Right. Um, also, news today. I mentioned it at the beginning of the show. Since we're here, we might as well uh, might as well bring it into uh, the spotlight. But Illinois has made a move on Lovey Smith. Lovey Smith will not return as head coach, and Illinois will begin its national search immediately. Tom, this was something that you were able to confirm before the school made it official. And I know that you've uh, on Twitter, follow him at Tom Fernelli. Uh, you've made some some of your thoughts known about how you would like to see the search go. Do you see there being much of a distance between what you would like to see Illinois do and what you think Illinois might do? Uh, I think that they're going to do what I think they should do. I just don't know if they're going to be successful to do it. And what I think they should do is go after Luke Fickle and go after Luke Fickle very hard. Give him your best offer, make him say no. And then after he says no, increase your offer and make him say no a second time until you know 100% that he's not going to take the job. Because I think that he is the obvious ploy for a Big Ten program that wants to improve its football program. You look at the success he's had at Cincinnati. You look at the fact that he's been a head coach in the Big Ten before at Ohio State. It was only for a year. He was only the interim coach. But before that, I mean, he played at Ohio State. He coached under Jim Trestle at Ohio State. He coached under Urban Meyer at Ohio State. He's been done a great job at Cincinnati as the head coach. He's a great recruiter. He has literally everything you could want as a head coach if you're a Power 5 Big Ten program. The question is, will Illinois be an attractive enough job for Fickle to leave Cincinnati because he's in that kind of position where – he could probably stay there for a while and have his pick and, you know, his choice of spots if bigger jobs come open in the future. And we saw last year, Michigan state was interested. He turned it down, but of course there were other things going on within that athletic department at Michigan state that played a role in him not being as interested in that job as he might've been had those, you know, the, the allegations, the sexual assault, the lawsuits, all that stuff. If that wasn't a part of Michigan state's athletic department, he might've been a lot more interested in that gig. We don't know. But I do think that you have to go there first. And I think that if we look at Josh Whitman, who is Illinois' athletic director, he kind of has that approach in that, you know, we got to, you have to remember, Lovey Smith took over in March 2016 after National Signing Day. Bill Cubitt had been the interim coach who took over just before the 2015 season when the school unexpectedly fired Tim Beckman because of allegations from players on the team about, you know, abuse and being forced to play through injuries and that kind of stuff there. Illinois was doing that against coaches before it became the cool thing to do in recent years. And Cubitt comes on as interim is pretty, you know, mediocre. But Illinois didn't have an athletic director at the time. Their AD had been fired. So then the school president and the board of trustees, since they had absolutely no idea how to conduct a coaching search and were in the process of, you know, looking for a new athletic director, named Cubit the new head coach and took the interim tag off of him. So then they hire Whitman and his very first day in charge, the very first thing he does is fire Cubit and hire Lovey Smith. So he already had that in the bag before he got the job. And while Lovey Smith didn't work out on the field, the mindset of that hire kind of gives you an idea of what Whitman's trying to do with the program. And then you look at college basketball, they fired John Gross, and then nobody really thought Brad Underwood was in play for Illinois. He was the sitting coach at a Power 5 program at Oklahoma State. He'd only been there for a year. And Whitman lured him away from a, a, a Big 12 job for an Illinois job with a pay raise so he's somebody who has a guy in mind he's not afraid to go after his big target he's going to swing and if he misses he misses so I think he's going to take that same kind of approach because the situation that whoever Illinois gets at this point is a lot better than the situation Lovey Smith inherited both with the timing of his you know hire and the conditions he took over in the fact the roster was just subpar for the Big Ten they didn't have the facilities they do now. They've got that $80 million football performance center that Lovey Smith was a big part in getting because he helped with the fundraising. And I think that this job, because of Lovey Smith, is going to be a lot more attractive to more coaches than it was last time around. It's just, I don't know if it's still attractive to Fickle. So after Fickle, I think Barton's boy, Lance Leopold from Buffalo is a name you're going to hear. He's, you know, 
he coached for eight years at Wisconsin Whitewater Division Three, but he played for seven national titles and won six of them. And I don't really care what level you're at. That kind of winning isn't by accident. And he's been successful at Buffalo. Uh, Sean Lewis at Kent State is, you know, a former player at Wisconsin, was part of Dino Babbers's staff at Eastern Illinois before he took over at Kent State. So he's from that Art Bryles tree of offense, which I think will be exciting and appealing to the Illinois fan base. So I expect he'll come up. Jay Norvell, people forget, you know, because he became, he was at Oklahoma and now he's the head coach at Nevada, but Jay Norvell's got Midwestern roots. He, he, he you know, he played Iowa. at Iowa. He coached yeah. at Iowa. He's part of like the whole Hayden Fry, Kirk Ferentz kind of, you know, tree. So he makes sense. I think another one of Barton's boys, Dave Clawson. Oh, I feel, okay. I feel like Dave Clawson is very similar to what Josh Whitman did with Brad Underwood, a coach at another power five program where you might think it's a lateral move, but if you offer him a significant raise and Dave Clawson feels like he's kind of maxed out what he can do at wake, maybe he listens. I don't think he'll take it, but I, I don't think it's crazy to at least try. Brad Jason. Underwood had escaped from Nagadoches, Texas and landed in Stillwater. Okay. Winston Salem is providing a little bit more for the Clawson family than what True. Brad Underwood had had. But you don't really have the, um, you don't have the money. You don't have the same kind of access and, things that you could do at Illinois that you can't, you know, at Wake Forest, you're kind of limited to what you could do. You're a small private school. Illinois is the state school. There's a lot more money involved. Without a doubt. So it might be more appealing. Uh, I think Jason Candle makes sense. It's just, I think Illinois might be gun shy to do the Toledo thing again after the Tim Beckman thing failed. And it turns out, oh, wait, they should have hired Tim Beckman's offensive coordinator at the time, a guy named Matt Campbell. Matt Campbell. And then if you're looking at coordinators, like once Luke Fickle says no, and I think he probably does, Say, hey, well, can you transfer Marcus me Freeman? to Marcus Freeman's office? <laughs> put me on his extension so I could talk to him. I think Freeman's a great candidate. He makes a lot of sense. I think Jim Leonard, Wisconsin's defensive coordinator, makes a ton of sense. I think Tom Manning, the Iowa State offensive coordinator, would make a lot of sense. And I know people have been pushing, like, Jeff Munkin's name, and I know that I am one of the big proponents of Power 5 programs running the option. And I think that that is something I would consider if I was in charge. I just don't think that based on what I told you of Josh Whitman, who let's remember played football at Illinois and is probably the first athletic director they've had in a long time. Who's one of primary goals is to make Illinois football program successful is going to go from trying to make a splash with Lovey Smith. And then five years later saying, all right, let's just run the option. So I don't think that's feasible for Illinois, but I would be okay with it. I just don't, I don't buy the, this would be the one that Fickle would take. Cause I think no, Fickle is, I. he's going to be so picky. Um, but I, yeah, the the other options that you threw out there are kind of all the ones that pop to mind as well. Leipold, uh, Munkin. Um, I've also heard Bielema. Some people are floating Bielema. He's trying to get in there with there. everybody in me. Yeah, so it's, it's like I don't. I feel like that is definitely going to be more interest on his part than Illinois. But again, I can't rule it out. It just I, I don't know how I would feel about it. Probably not too excited. You would come around. First, first time they kneel the ball inside the five yard line to close out a game like he did when it was borderline erotic at the Texas Bowl. Uh, I feel like if you're going to go for that Wisconsin stuff, I would much rather have Jim Leonard than Bielema at this point. Fair. Uh, so I think that we can say that any of our predictions that we weren't going to see a lot of movement on the coaching carousel. I think we can say that that's uh, that's that's not happening. And you know whether the motivations are, you know, the SEC feels good about its financial future, and so they're just not really worried about spending that money because they think they're going to get it down the line. As we've seen, South Carolina, Vanderbilt, and now Auburn all decide to to go forward and make changes. Whether it's at a place like Illinois, where you feel like, man, if if he's never going to beat Pat Fitzgerald, we got to get somebody that can beat Pat Fitzgerald. Uh, what is the where are our, our eyes now? I mean, Texas got we got this, you know, we've put them to the side, but I mean, Chris Del Conte didn't come out here and be like, I promise Tom Herman's our coach for 2021. He just said Tom Herman is our coach. Michigan, we've got reports as though um there is maybe discussion about a new contract. There, those reports have been shot down by current athletic director Ward Manuel, but still it feels like we're not pushing 
Jim Harbaugh out the door quite yet at Michigan. Do you feel differently about either Texas or Michigan, or where do you think we might see at the Power Five level another big job come open? This For Michigan, this isn't just, again, my read of the situation, not based on anything I've, with, I've talked to anybody about. I think if they were going to move on from Harbaugh, they'd already done it. I think that with signing day coming up next week, they would have made the decision or at least made the announcement that he's leaving at the end of the year. I think the fact that we've seen the reports that they're working on an extension and, you know, maybe it won't be for as much money, but, you know, both sides are interested. I think, I think Harbaugh's back in Ann Arbor and I think he's going to be back in Ann Arbor for a few years. And I kind of feel the same way about Tom Herman, because like we talked about on Saturday night show, I think it was one of those situations where if we can get urban, we'll move on. If we can't, we're going to go another year. I think a little bit of buzz around the pop at Duke, not that mm-hmm. Cutcliffe was fired, but that he may just ride off in the sunset. Mm. Um, I would assume Virginia Tech isn't out of the woods yet, even though they did get the, that W last night. Um, and... I don't know. Things are starting to loosen up. That's for sure. Nobody's nobody's scared about having like a PR blowback from making a change. Like the first couple jobs have come and gone. And I was like, okay, what we do. Just, seal's been broken. Seal's been broken. You can follow him on Twitter at Tom Fernelli. You can follow him at Barton Simmons. You can follow me at Chip underscore Patterson. Uh, be sure to subscribe to the Cover 3 podcast wherever you get your podcast. We will be back on Monday as we uh, do – Two things at once. We will both be doing some of our normal Monday activities. Early line look ahead won't be as long as we got conference championship Saturday, but breaking down some of the headlines, we'll welcome DK into the conversation about these coaching changes. I'm sure we will also be getting you prepped for national signing day, which is this Wednesday. Uh, Just so much coverage on CBS sports HQ. Uh, I think it is actually 29 hours in a 24 hour day of coverage on CBS Sports HQ, live announcements, rankings, updates. Uh, You're going to want to be a part of it because Barton Simmons is a part of it, along with many of his 24 seven sports national recruiting experts. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Thank you.